Welcome everyone. I'm Pam Cole with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And I'd like to welcome you today to uh, the Energy Codes Commentator webinar on achieving a more meaningful assessment of commercial building code compliance. And we hold these webinars the second Thursday of every other month at the same time. So keep a watch out on the Building Energy Codes training page as topics get, get, gets added. So the next webinar will be in December. If you have any topic suggestions and you'd like us to consider, please email them into us and you can use the same email that you received for your webinar reminder for the webinar messages that you received. So what this webinar is about is it's going to describe two recent studies that have attempted to develop a deeper, more meaningful assessment of commercial building code compliance. The first study was conducted by PNNL trying to answer the question, how much energy cost savings can be achieved through better compliance? And the second study that we'll be discussed today was done by Ecotope, and it argues the evaluating codes should be directed at perennial need to understand and approve the construction of new buildings. So as far as learning objectives, at the end of this course or this webinar, participants, what they will, should be able to take away is, why are commercial energy code compliance assessments more challenging than residential assessments? And what are more meaningful assessments of energy code compliance than simple pass or fail metrics? How code evaluations can support interdependent efforts such as code design, enforcement training, and utility programs. And then the last objective would be, what is the relationship between code compliance and post-occupancy energy use? So I would like to introduce my speakers to you today, and we really appreciate them taking the time um, out to share this information with us. We have Mike Rosenberg from PNNL and Poppy Storm with Ecotope, and they will be discussing these two studies. And I'd like, Mike, go ahead and take it away and begin. Okay, thank you very much, Pam. Um, first, a little bit of background before we get into the study itself. So, why is commercial compliance different than residential? It's a lot more difficult, and there's a number of reasons for that. First, it's just the size of the code. The residential code, the IECC Energy Efficiency Chapter is 13 pages long. Uh, the IECC Commercial Chapter is 62 pages long. There's a lot more measures to verify in compliance. In our residential studies that we're doing now, compliance studies, we're looking at 11 different measures. In the commercial studies, it's about 100. And then it, the code changes at a more rapid pace in commercial than residential. Since 2004, there's been 191 changes to the residential code, the IECC, 263 to ASHRAE standard 90.1. And then those changes themselves are at a different level of complexity. So building controls, things like temperature resets, pump controls, daylighting controls, fan controls, there's only four of those that have been introduced into the IECC, the residential code, since 2004. 70 of them in, in the commercial code. And then the building types that you're dealing with. The residential code deals with single family and low rise multifamily. The commercial code deals with high rise multifamily, warehouse, offices, schools, labs, assembly buildings, sports arenas, hospitals, medical office buildings, retail, hotels, industrial, it just goes on and on. And then finally, the HVAC equipment. In a, in a residential, um, in the residential code, you're, you're mostly dealing with furnaces, heat pumps, air conditioners, maybe electric wall cadets, and radiant heaters, or radiant floor heating. In the um, commercial, you're dealing with all those, plus variable air volume systems, built-up multi-zone systems, water source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, fan coil units. You've got cooling towers and pumps and eight different kinds of chillers. You've got boilers, chill beams, uh, just much more complex. This next picture uh, shows what you might see if you go into the mechanical room in a commercial building. So it's obviously a pretty complex place. Okay, uh, previous compliance studies done by DOE focus on checklists and percent compliance. They were basically pass-fail. There was a binary decision made for each, for each requirement. Did it pass or didn't it pass? The impact of partial compliance wasn't really considered. So if you had a building that the lighting power was 10 watts over the allowance, it failed. If it was 1,000 watts over the allowance, it failed. There was no distinction made between those two. 
and then the relative importance of different requirements were either, either ignored or not looked at objectively. So uh, quantitatively, what's the difference between uh, building equipment efficiency that doesn't pass or lighting power that doesn't pass or insulation that doesn't pass? That was really not uh, done in an analytical way. This is a copy of uh, one of the previous checklists that we used in DOE commercial compliance studies. You could see here each of the requirements. And then just you check off, does it comply, does it not comply, you can't see it, or it doesn't apply to the building. So that level of information, and then maybe some comments. So the current project, it was a pilot project. Uh, we wanted to not ask the question, does the building comply, but instead ask a different question. How much energy cost savings could be gained through or saved through better compliance with the code? And how do we capture that savings effectively? So really, how much savings is being left on the table through noncompliance, and how can we capture it with the biggest bang for the buck? So the pilot project took a very simple approach. Uh, we looked at one building type, one building type, small office buildings with simple HVAC systems in one climate zone, 4C, that's the western part of the Pacific Northwest, and then one code, the 2012 IECC, International Energy Conservation Code. So before we could actually go out and do audits and assessments, we had to do some upfront preliminary analysis. The first thing we did was we went through the IECC and we identified all the individual requirements. Turns out that there's 396 different requirements in the 2012 IECC commercial provisions. Uh, we went through those and we eliminated all those that didn't apply to the building type that we were dealing with, the small office building, didn't apply to simple HVAC systems, uh, didn't apply to climate zone 4C, and those that were not responsible directly for energy savings, like administrative requirements. Once we did that, we had 149 requirements left. Then we looked at those requirements and we grouped them into what we call measures. So for instance, for occupancy sensors, there's basically three requirements in the code. The first says that certain space types, like enclosed offices, need to have an occupancy sensor present. The second says it has to be a manual on. It can't just turn the lights on when somebody walks in. You have to turn the lights on manually and it automatically turns them off. That's sometimes called a vacancy sensor. And then the third requirement is that all the lights must shut off within 30 minutes of the last occupant leaving the room. So those three requirements became one occupancy sensor measure. So we did that with all, this, with all the 149 requirements and we ended up with 63 measures applicable to our building type and climate zone. Once we identified those measures, we first identified what the code condition was, uh, and we also identified two conditions worse than code. We called them below and worst. So for example, roof insulation is a requirement for the U value of roof insulation. If it's got all the, uh, for the requirement, there's a requirement for the U value of roofs. If it's got all the insulation it needs, that's 100% of the required U value. Uh, less insulation, our below code condition was 150%. And then the worst condition was no insulation at all. Thermostat dead band, which is a requirement that says there needs to be an offset between the heating and cooling set points on a thermostat. The code condition is a five degree dead band. Uh, below code condition we identified was two degrees. And then the worst case, no dead band at all. Interior lighting power allowance, it meets the whole building lighting power, that's the code condition. It exceeds it by 50%, that is the below code condition. And the worst was that it exceeded it by 100%. And we did that just like for these three for the remaining um, measures, so, so we had conditions for all of them. Next, we needed to assign a, a lost energy cost savings for each of those conditions for each of those measures. So we did that using energy simulation. Uh, PNNL has developed a suite of prototype buildings that we use for analysis. Uh, for this analysis, we use the small office prototype. We use na average national utility rates from EIA. And then once we got the lost savings, we normalized it to the appropriate metric for the measure. So for example, uh, if it's roof insulation per square foot of roof insulation, if it was cooling efficiency per tons of cooling. So uh, showing here, for example, for the roof, obviously if it has 100% uh, of the required U value, the code condition, there's no lost energy cost savings. Simulation showed us that if it was 150% of the required U value, that was worth 1.5 cents per square foot of roof area. And then if there was no insulation at all in the roof, 53.7 cents, the worst condition. Interior lighting power allowance, once again, if it meets, if it meets the code requirement, low loss savings. If it exceeds the 
allowance by 50%, that was worth 15.2 cents per square foot of building per year. If it exceeded it by 100%, 30.4 cents per square foot of building per year. And we did that for all the measures. Okay, so the preliminary analysis is done. Now a little bit about the field work. So one thing this um, pilot project did not do is develop a recruiting strategy or a sampling procedure. Uh, that really wasn't the research question that we were interested in. It was more about the, the question of determining the lost energy cost savings. Uh, we hired a contractor to do the actual uh, field auditing. That was Ecotope, Poppy's company. Uh, they used the Dodge database of new construction and um, used a cold call approach. So they identified 121 candidate buildings that fit our requirements, newly constructed, small office buildings, simple HVAC systems, uh, in climate zone 4C, and out of those 121 candidates, they were only able to recruit nine of them. So 7.4% recruiting success rate, so pretty low. And on average, it took 10 phone calls to each of those nine buildings to screen, recruit, and schedule the visits. Uh, it turned out that for this whole process, recruiters spent about 135 person hours to get the nine buildings. So that's about 14 hours spent in recruiting per building. So obviously, very, very time intensive and, um, you know, obviously we, we probably need to explore some other ways of doing this than the cold call approach. Uh, for the field, the field audit procedure, the first thing they did was to collect construction documents and review those uh, and then go out to the building itself. And, and from both those, the, the document review and the field audit, they were able to determine the condition of each of the 63 measures. Now, they only went to each site once. Uh, that has some implications, mostly that you're not going to see everything on one site visit. So, for example, if you go, you know, right at or after occupancy, you're not going to see slab perimeter, perimeter insulation or wall insulation. So, for those measures that they could not directly visibly observe, they had to infer the condition from the document review, construction document review. Okay, so after collecting all that data from the nine buildings, the condition of each measure, uh, the calculation of lost savings. It's really pretty straightforward based on the savings that we uh, assigned to the conditions um, in the preliminary analysis. So for example, if they went out to a building and there was 900 square feet of roof area in that building, and the U-value was 150% of what's required by code, we previously determined that was worth 1.5 cents per square foot multiplied by the number of square feet, so for that building, that condition, the roof insulation that did not meet code was worth lost energy cost savings of $13.50 per year for that building. So the entire building lost energy cost savings is simply the sum of all the measures. And the sample lost energy cost savings is the sum of all the buildings, of all nine buildings. So a summary of the results. So there were 63 measures. It turned out that 19 of them were not applicable in any of the nine buildings that we visited. Uh, for example, there were no basements in the nine building sample, so the basement, the below grade wall insulation measure was not applicable. Uh, there were no skylights, so skylight U factors and solar heat gain coefficients were not applicable. Um, of those that were applicable, 95% of them we, were verifiable. So either through plan or inspection, uh, they were able to tell the, the condition of the measure. 5% they could not tell at all. And of those that, they, um, that were verifiable, 75% complied. So thinking in terms of the old DOE methodology, pass fail, the sample of nine buildings would have scored a 75% compliance rate. But as we discussed, that's, we're interested in, in some different results here, and that's what's shown below. So you can see these are the nine buildings. They were relatively small buildings, 27,000 feet total. Uh, each of the buildings were showing the annual lost energy cost savings per year, so ranged from a low of $101 per year for this building to a high of $638 per year for this building. And then what we also did is we looked at the lost savings from a life cycle cost perspective. So over the life of the building, what the present value of the lost energy cost savings would be. So in summary, if all nine buildings would have complied fully with the code, the total savings would have been $3,372 per year, or $46,430 over the life of the building. So that answers the question, 
what's the lost energy cost savings that could be recovered through better compliance for this nine building sample. Uh, you know, this was a simplified approach. Uh, one thing that we didn't do is consider the uh, interactive effects of different measures having, having different conditions. So for example, if you combine windows that are worse than code with an HVAC system that's worse than code, your lost energy cost savings is going to be worse than if you have those same windows and an HVAC system that met code. Uh, the the um, procedure that I just outlined didn't account for that. So we wanted to test that and see, okay, how important is that simplification? So what we did is we took an average, the average condition for each of the measures that we found out in the buildings, and we combined those into one single interactive building model. And then we compared the lost energy cost savings from that interactive model to the sum of the lost energy cost savings from the individual uh, measures. And so you can see here from the interactive simulation, the result was $3,603. Uh, lost energy cost savings, and you can compare that with the sum of the individual measures, 3,372, a difference of $231, or 6.8% difference. So a fairly modest difference, probably worth the simplification in our mind. Okay, um, something else that this study did that I don't think has really been done in any of these compliance studies before is we had the auditors track time to verify compliance. So they track the time for individual measures. So how long did it take them to count lights? How long did it take them to assess the roof insulation? Uh, but also how much time did it take them to drive out to the site, to collect the plans, to go through any kind of security screenings that they needed to do, those indirect costs. And then they prorated the indirect costs to the measures and we were able to identify a verification time for each of the measures. So we're showing here in this table, so we're listing each of the measures and how much time they took. So for example, to verify mechanical systems commissioning, whether that was done or not, that took a little less than a half hour for all nine buildings. Uh, you could see if we look at a high one, uh, interior lighting power allowance, that took uh, four and three quarter hours to determine the lighting power in, each, in all the nine buildings together. So in total, 60, 61 hours approximately, um, it was spent on verifying measures that did have some below code potential savings. So in other words, some, these, these, the 61 hours is for all measures that, didn't, that did not comply, at least in some of the buildings. 41 hours was also spent on buildings, on measures that complied in all the buildings. It, it takes time, obviously, to, to see that measures comply. Uh, so 102 hours for the nine building sample. So it's about 11 hours per building that was spent on this uh, on this uh, pilot project. And these are pretty small, simple buildings. Uh, here I've added the lost um, life cycle cost savings uh, for each of the measures, along with the verification hours. Um, so you can see pretty high. The commissioning was a big uh, lost energy cost savings. Uh, equipment oversizing was uh, pretty significant. Um, some of the others, damper, damper control when spaces are unoccupied, pretty low. Uh, so if we combine those lost energy cost savings with the verification hours, we created a new metric, uh, potential loss savings recovered per hour of verification. And you can see a pretty big range. Mechanical system requirement had the biggest bang for the buck, potentially, uh, all the way down to the damper control low. Uh, kind of an average uh, for all the applicable measures, we could recover potentially $455 over the life of these nine buildings per hour spent on verification. So uh, this is the biggest bang for the buck question. So a little bit about ranking these measures. So our thoughts are that for all compliance studies in the future, it's probably not realistic to verify all the measures. Um, you know, I said we spent about 11 hours on each of the nine buildings, and they're pretty simple buildings. Uh, that might not be within the resources that some studies have. So we wanted to look at some ways to prioritize the measures and, and try to make things uh, simpler. For this, these simple buildings, we had, we had uh, 63 measures. If we have a complex buildings with central plants, chillers, boilers, laboratory, hospital, we could easily double the number of measures. So you can see it can quickly get out of hand. 
Um, so to prioritize, we looked at two different ways of prioritizing these measures. Uh, you know, the, the focusing on the biggest bang for the buck, the, the dollar save per verification hour. And then the second way was from the simulation sensitivity analysis that we did up front, the preliminary analysis where we looked at the highest potential loss cost savings of the worst case condition. So this chart is just another way of looking at the table that we looked at before, the savings per verification hour. We saw the range of numbers, but seeing it graphically really shows. There's a really big difference. Maybe there's no point in looking at some of the ones down here. Now, one thing to keep in mind, these are results from a nine building sample. We're not making the case that you should, that anyone should take these results and then not look at these measures, but this is just to test the procedure. So in a larger study, much larger than nine buildings, we'll get the same kind of data where maybe we can draw conclusions about which of these measures need to be looked at and which maybe don't, depending on the resources available. Uh, this table shows some interesting results. We took the, um, we, we took the dollar save per verification hour and we grouped them into bins of high loss savings per verification hour, medium loss savings, low loss savings, those measures that were compliant with the code and those measures that didn't apply at all to the code. And it turns out that 14% of the measures or nine measures were responsible for 81% of the savings. So, you know, that's pretty clear that we did not have to look at most of the measures to get most of the savings in this building sample. And we think that's going to carry out uh, when larger samples are looked at as well. Okay, the second way that I mentioned, ranking based on the sensitivity analysis, we identified the worst case condition up front and we simulated the worst, the lost energy cost savings from that. So we can tell what's the worst possible lost energy cost savings for each of these measures. In other words, if it didn't comply at all with the worst thing you might, the worst cost savings you could have. And that's what this chart shows. And also, once again, a very big range. Uh, so you might want to draw a line here, here. I mean, if it's a, a well-funded study or if it's a true jurisdictional compliance um, assessment, they may want to look at everything. Others may want to look at just some of these. Um, the good thing about this second methodology is that it can be done up front before you're even out in the field, so in a future study. So the, the, the bang for the buck metric, we need to collect a lot more data in order to make some um, determinations of impact from that. This one can be done up front through simulation and really save some field time in future studies. Okay, um, future implications. What, is, what are we gonna do with this, uh, these results? What have we learned going forward? A um, Couple of things. I think the first thing that's important is what we just talked about, the prioritizing measures. Uh, we want to eliminate the, the low worst case uh, potential loss savings based on upfront simulation analysis. And then once a lot more data is collected, we want to rank these things again and possibly change that, uh, you know, possibly be able to eliminate more measures even. So, um, you know, the time it took, 11 hours per building for a simple building, and obviously that's going to be longer for complex buildings. It's just, it's not going to be within the reach of many compliance studies to spend that much time. Uh, the second thing has to do with the recruiting. Um, 135 person hours to recruit nine buildings, 14 hours a building is probably not doable long term. We got to find a better way. Uh, the seven and a half percent success rate with cold calling, also not something that probably is going to have long term success. So the other way that we think has some potential and we want to um, test out is trying to piggyback these types of compliance assessments with jurisdictional compliance activities. So in other words, try to um, connect with the building officials and jurisdictions and become part of the process when they go out to sites, you go out there with them when they access documents, uh, these compliance studies access documents at the same time. So you're not spending time trying to recruit. Recruiting is sort of almost a non-issue if this can work out. So that's something we really want to um, try in the future. And then finally, the last, um, I think, lesson learned here is that one building, one visit is not enough to assess all measures. We don't really want to rely on document review um, to, determine, to determine the condition of the measures. 
we really need to see what's going on out in the field if we want to have confidence in the results. And that means that one site is not going to work for each building in order to, to verify all measures. That doesn't mean you have to go out to each site more than once. Uh, the residential compliance study is taking a different approach. They go to each home one time, but they only collect the data during that one visit that's visible. So if they go after the home is mostly constructed, they're not going to see wall insulation. If they go during framing, they're going to see, or right after framing, they're going to see wall insulation. So they just have to go to more homes to collect the number of data points that they're looking for, but they're not getting them all from one house. Okay, so um, further, I mentioned this was a pilot study. Uh, DOE is taking the approach that we developed in this pilot study and rolling it out in a much bigger study. Uh, they recently awarded $1.7 million to IMT, the Institute of Market Transformation, and they're going to be looking at up to 250 buildings in three states uh, beginning right away and, uh, you know, giving feedback and tweaking this process and, and trying to optimize it. Uh, so that we can get some some good results and uh, and more data. So that's it. Uh, as Pam said, you know I can address questions at the end, but now I'm going to turn it over to Poppy Storm from Ecotope. Go ahead, Poppy. Thank I you. I take a minute to get it over. Yes, I'm just switching my screen. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a pilot study that Ecotope implemented with the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. So we designed and tested a methodology to initially look at code compliance assessment, but that quickly turned into a broader code evaluation. And in this PowerPoint, I'm going to focus mainly on the conceptual framework for this methodology, plus some of the results that really illustrate the value of the data and analysis that, is the, that are the main output of the methodology. So I'll start with a little bit of the background and the, the key drivers for the study. So as I mentioned, it started out as a code compliance study and it was a pilot and it was looking at addressing some of the same issues that Mike just described, just the complexity and, and cost of doing a commercial code compliance study. But as we were proceeding through the study design phase, a major disconnect emerged between what the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance's goals were, they're referred to as NIA. Their goals um, were not really aligned with a straight code compliance study where, where you're getting a straight code compliance determination. So in spite of the fact that that was the initial plan, they really were looking at getting a deeper value and that's why we had to transition the methodology. NIA focuses a lot on market transformation, so they're working holistically on many fronts where they're looking at emerging technology reviews, measure development, uh, utility programs, and codes. And so they, they are able to expand their understanding of what a code compliance study should be and, and broaden it to um, other groups and teams within their organization to add more value for the region. So their goals really were to inform code development, to inform training and enforcement efforts. They also were very interested in looking at uh, progress and energy performance in new commercial buildings and hopefully looking at that over time. And so they really wanted to get some actionable results from their investment in, in this type of study. And so that's when our study design 
really moved into being more of an evaluation approach that moves away from this narrow compliance determination where you're looking at a uh, hundred or nearly a hundred individual components and having an approach that moves more towards building systems and understanding the impacts of characteristics and the code on actual energy use. So, in this sense, um, because codes are, are working within this larger ecosystem of this transition in, in new construction, codes are seeking to influence code current practice, essentially. If, if we move away from just the, the strict interpretation of codes and the development of codes. Really, ultimately, we're trying to see, uh, in many cases, a steep decline in energy use in the building stock across the country. And in this particular case, we're looking at the four states of the Northwest. So, codes are seeking to influence current practice, and they're doing that in order to reduce energy use over time. So the objective of this methodology is to determine how new commercial buildings are actually being built, what level of code compliance is achieved in those buildings, and how that compliance influences energy use. And to do this, uh, we were really focusing on empirical data and looking at compliance within the context of overall energy use. So the compliance was determined by going out to 12 sites in Washington State and collecting detailed characteristics for those buildings and then analyzing the compliance of those of some of those characteristics by major system type, looking at envelope mechanical and lighting. So this approach allowed for a direct comparison of our compliance findings with the detailed characteristics, the system, system designs, and the actual energy performance of the building. So current practice and actual energy use are at the heart of this methodology. And the reason why that is a, a central theme for the study is that if programs, code programs, are seeking to influence current practice and, and reducing energy use over time, then current practice and energy use, the actual energy use and characteristics of these buildings should be at the heart of the code evaluation. And to do that, we actually need to be looking at whole buildings. So we're understanding on a building by building basis, what are the, how are the systems designed in this building? What are the key characteristics? What level of compliance are they achieving? And what is the energy use in each of those individual buildings so that it can be extended statistically across the, the entire building stock of a state, for example, which is the intention uh, for the future implementation of this methodology. So a compliance determination is important, but it should, in an, over, in an evaluation, but it really should be supported by detailed characteristics so that the building systems that are contributing to the energy use can be understood and used to improve future codes. So we need to understand how buildings are being built so that we can know how to design better buildings. And that's, that's really a precursor to designing better codes. It's, it's all connected to improving the building design and construction so that we can reduce the energy use. And I think this is especially important for mechanical systems. We've, we've made some good progress. I think this is overall um, for the national codes, but particularly what we're seeing in Washington State and, and other states in the Northwest. We've, we've made pretty good progress on 
influencing the lighting designs and the envelope designs, and we're seeing lower energy use as a result of that. But we are not really seeing that same level of reduced energy in the mechanical systems. And so that is um, one of the underlying drivers for, for this study and understanding how the buildings are actually being constructed and how the systems are working is so that we can understand how the codes could be changed to actually decrease the energy use in the mechanical system beyond just um, the efficiency of, of the equipment themselves. So ideally codes are targeting deeper and deeper energy savings and reducing energy use over time. So a key research objective for this methodology, just to summarize, is to determine whether or not this is actually happening. Is there a relationship between commercial energy code compliance and actual energy use? And if so, what are those characteristics and designs that are driving the differences? For example, and this is something that I'll be showing in our, some of our graphics from the pilot, but for example, do compliant offices use less energy than non-compliant offices? Is that compliance actually delivering lower energy use? And do compliant offices built to the current code use less energy than offices built to the previous code? So are we actually making progress? And so the important thing is, is that this type of characteristics and energy benchmarking along with the code compliance, these all need the same core data. They need these detailed characteristics and they need the energy use. And once you get that core data, you can analyze it in a number of different ways. And, and that's, that's another key aspect of this methodology. So fortunately, um, in the Northwest, and, and this goes for many areas, uh, we have multiple stakeholders for this type of data and analysis. So the overall approach is delivering a wide spectrum of value. So the benchmark characteristics and the new an understanding of the new construction practices, that can feed into utility conservation potential assessments. It can lead to better designs if the design community are accessing the data. We also have uh, regional energy planning in the Pacific Northwest, and so they are, these planners are very dependent on having a baseline to, to assess the conservation potential for the energy plans. We're also identifying major compliance gaps, which help support uh, enforcement, training, and education in general. We're benchmarking new construction EUIs in particular, which is also very important for conservation potential assessments, and also for developing outcome-based targets for new construction. If, if we're looking at uh, performance targets, it's really good to have an understanding, particularly for new construction, what, what are those EUIs? What are we actually getting now? What, what should the programs or the codes actually be targeting if we are thinking that we may be moving in that direction at some point with outcome-based codes? And we're also informing commercial code development and program development. And this relationship between the code development and program development is important because the programs, the new construction programs, are indexed to the codes. And so they really need similar information. So ultimately, what this methodology is delivering is a compliance assessment along with an updated commercial new construction baseline, which will ultimately be delivered on a state-by-state -state basis with the opportunity for utilities to do oversamples so that they can have an understanding of, of what the characteristics and energy use look like in their specific utility service territories. 
And we're also providing modeling inputs because of the detailed level of characteristics. We're providing modeling inputs for ex ante savings estimates. When we develop a new code, we need to apply that to the baseline and have an understanding of what type of what level of energy savings we're getting there. Another key aspect of this methodology is that it's linked by building systems as opposed to dozens of individual codes. This is this is how we're moving away from the components and, and trying to understand things more on a systems level. So we have three major main aspects of this methodology. One is a compliance assessment, one is an enforcement assessment, which involved interviews with jurisdictions, and the third is an energy performance assessment. I'm only going to be discussing the results from the compliance assessment and the energy performance assessment in this presentation. But we're focusing on building systems rather than kind of more mechanistic, reductionist approach for assessing straight code compliance, which was focusing on a sum of the compliance of many components, which doesn't really tell you a lot, except that you have such and such percentage of compliance. So we're bracing more of a holistic approach, which is focused on the building systems that end up determining the overall energy use. And we're also looking at the larger ecosystem of code design, code enforcement, and the distinct design communities that are delivering those systems. And this is important because really when you're looking at changing buildings, you're looking at changing behavior and changing behavior on the part of designers, developers, contractors. And so it's important to be looking at this compliance and the characteristics on a systems level so that you can then reach out to those communities of these different designers and have a good understanding of where the potential and opportunities are in those specific areas. So we're, we're able to hone in on the key determinants of energy use in the different systems to understand the, the direction for for potential changes. So each of these phases is focusing on the same building system specifically so that the findings can be compared across each of these phases of the methodology because we're trying to understand the relationship between the characteristics, the compliance, the enforcement, the did or did not lead to compliance and the ultimate energy performance of those same buildings. So for each of the major systems, we're focusing on high value aspects of those systems. And these are the areas that we decided to look at for this study based on research into previous studies and our own experience with commercial building design and evaluation. They also align somewhat with the sensitivity analysis that PNNL did and in future larger studies with working groups we're going to be looking at the, uh, the choices here in more detail and we may revise these. But essentially for the envelope we're looking at the overall UA based on the individual component UA. So we're gathering all of those details to develop the overall UA. We're also looking for mechanical, for the mechanical system, we're looking at equipment efficiency, economizer compliance, heat recovery, and controls. For service water, which is really just a subset of mechanical, but we broke it out for this study, we're looking at equipment efficiency, pump scheduling, and pipe insulation. 
And for lighting, we're looking at both interior LPG and exterior lighting power, and we collected data on controls. So here's a, a flow of the compliance assessment steps. We did do a, a sample design for the entire four states, but that was just an aspect of the pilot study to, to test out an approach for doing a larger scale sample design using Dodge new construction data. But ultimately, we targeted uh, 15 to 20 sites in Washington State, and we ultimately ended up actually doing audits on 12 sites. And it was a mix of multifamily offices, retail schools, and warehouses. So we developed a, a detailed characteristics audit protocol that was based on some previous new construction baseline studies that have been implemented in the Northwest. The last one that was done was about 10 years ago. So we do have some historical data, but these future studies in the Northwest would be a pretty major update to the data that we had previously on a state level. Then we implemented our recruiting, which we had a similar approach to the approach that uh, Mike described. We used the contacts from the Dodge data and did cold calling. It was also difficult in this pilot, and we're looking at some other alternatives as well, potentially coordinating with the jurisdictions, but also maybe coordinating with the utilities who are all key stakeholders for NIA and could potentially be involved in the implementation and support of the research. So we gathered as, as much information as we could from the buildings as well as in some cases from the building departments and we implemented a detailed plan and on-site audit for the 12 buildings. Then we assembled a new construction characteristics database for those 12 buildings and we calculated the LPD and the UA and did some other preliminary analysis on the results on the data that we actually collected from the buildings. And then we did a compliance assessment for each of those areas of the major code sections. And th these compliance assessments were specific to each building. So we were looking into the code and determining exactly what was required for each of these areas for these particular buildings. So now I'm going to talk about some of the results. And I would just like to emphasize that these are results from the small pilot. They they are pretty interesting, I think, in some cases, and, and they really show what type of analysis we could do with a statistically representative sample, but they, they aren't representative of anything except for these 12 buildings in Washington State. But that was the purpose of the pilot. So in most cases, for the actual compliance assessment, we used a binary approach where it was comply or does not comply. And that's what this graphic is showing for each of the main systems. It's showing red for non-complying for that building for that system and green for complying. And then on the right, you see a some of the, the percentage of complying buildings for each of those sections, and then also the complying percentage for the buildings overall. In future studies, we are considering potentially moving away from the binary determination, at least in things like LPD and UA, where we could have a spectrum of compliance. And that may be useful for understanding the, the impact of the compliance 
But we do have the underlying characteristics, so even if we're looking at a comply does not comply, we're able to drill down deeper. For example, this this row here is really an example of how this straight compliance determination is not actually that helpful because we determine the compliance for each of these these systems based on the compliance of the sub components. And then if any one of those systems was not compliant, the whole building was deemed not compliant. So it, it also shows how the approach to the compliance determination can really influence um, the outcome, which, like I said, isn't actually very useful or important, which is what this graphic really shows. What what does it actually, how does it help you to know that 50% of these buildings were not compliant? It, you could draw a lot of conclusions, but it, it doesn't really help you to move forward to know what you really would need to do to change these outcomes. So, Moving into some of the characteristics, this is a graphic of the compliance versus non-compliance for the building heat loss, which is estimated, which is normalized by floor area. So these are all of uh, the buildings that we could um, provide enough data for this determination. This particular building did not have enough data for the as review. The green is what we're actually seeing in the building. The blue is what was required, which this is the allowance for that particular building based on the Washington State Energy Code. So what we're seeing here is a little bit more useful information because what we can see is that across all of these buildings, we are consistently, except in a couple places, this building and this building on the right, we can see that we're almost always meeting or exceeding the allowance, or in this case, um, improving on, on, that, on that UA. So this is useful information because if we have, this is for only a small set of buildings, but if we were looking at this statistically across the whole state, we could draw some conclusions from it. Um, for example, if we are consistently dramatically undershooting the allowance uh, for the building heat loss, then that probably needs to be changed in the code. And we just currently don't have this type of information for new construction. We, we do have a pretty robust existing building stock assessment, the CBSA, Commercial Building Stock Assessment in the Northwest. It's done every five years, but we do not have a new construction specific uh, assessment. And that's what this, uh, st these studies are actually going to fill that gap. So moving on to the mechanical subcomponent compliance, this is just um, for the mechanical compliance row that we had in that previous graphic. This is looking at it with the specific components for the equipment efficiency, the economizer, and the heat recovery. So this is just an example of kind of drilling down, okay, this is not a compliant mechanical system. Why didn't it comply? Was it the efficiency? Was it the economizer? Was it the heat recovery? Where are we really um, failing there? This graphic is looking at the interior LPD, lighting power density by building. And this uh, we are actually seeing where we have the blue is the LPD allowance for each of the buildings and the green is the as reviewed LPD. We're seeing consistency, consistently a much lower LPD. And what we were seeing in the characteristics for these buildings is that I believe it was 100% of the buildings had some LEDs, and many of them had a significant amount of LPDs. 
So what we're seeing is that, that if, if we were to be doing this in a statistical survey, we could surmise that we actually are seeing some market transformation with LEDs and we also are seeing that these choices by the lighting designers are delivering much lower LPDs, which can actually be problematic in cases where there is a, a building that the designers are going the, the targeted performance route with modeling where they're actually saving a lot on the LPD via LEDs and then unfortunately they can actually um, not be having as good of a building for the envelope and, and the mechanical system. So these kinds of trade-offs, it's important to understand what the construction is actually looking like so that we can understand the impact of and potential risks of these types of trade-offs. So moving to the energy performance assessment methodology, ideally you want to delay at least 12 months and preferably 18 months or more before you get the bills for these buildings. And in the case of the buildings that were in the pilot study, they were already complete and in some cases they had been complete for quite a while, which also contributed to the difficulty in recruiting because the farther away from the actual completion of the building, the more difficult it is to get a hold of the right people. But nonetheless, for purposes of the energy performance assessment, we were able to go out and get at least 12 months and in many cases 18 months worth of, of bills for these buildings. So we collected the billing data for both gas and electric from the relevant utilities. We did a deep data QC on the site, looking at the particular site, trying to understand what type of energy use they would likely need to have. Are we looking at 100% occupancy or not? So that we were really just looking at the, the viable site. And we determined the total EUIs for each of those buildings. And then we used a tool called EasySim to disaggregate the end uses. And the approach to this is to do pretty much a straight change point analysis to disaggregate the heating loads, the HVAC loads, and then we're using the characteristics that we've gathered from the buildings, such as the LPD and the UA, to disaggregate some of the other, the other end uses. Then we're taking both the total UA, I mean the total EUIs and the disaggregated end use EUIs and correlating those with the compliance determination for these buildings for each of those systems. So we have the EUIs for each of those end, major end uses and we have the compliance for each of those major end uses. Then we did a benchmarking exercise where we were comparing the end use EUIs and the total EUIs to the same data from the 2006 commercial new construction baseline that was implemented in all four states in the Northwest. And we were comparing it specifically to the relevant buildings for the Washington State portion of that study. So all of this is they, they all really become critical inputs for tracking energy use over time because we do have this 2006 benchmark for all four states. Now we're moving forward into uh, doing updated studies for these four states and then doing it in a way that we can move forward over time and actually be tracking this on a consistent basis and have a foundation for this type of analysis moving forward. So here are some of the results from this analysis. Again, it's from a small pilot, but it communicates the type of analysis we could do with a larger sample. So we have these bars broken out into uh, four of the building types, elementary school, medical office, retail grocery. Uh, that's because it was um, a big box 
retail that included grocery, and then we also have small offices. So if we were looking at these um, bars for a larger study, it's likely that we might look at all the individual buildings um, just to see what we could find, but we would likely be looking at aggregates of the buildings and trying to understand the relationship between the EUIs for the complying buildings and the EUIs for the non-complying buildings on an aggregate level. But here we have them broken out into the individual buildings. So the red bars are the non-complying buildings and then there's a code for which system was not complying and the green is a complying building. So for elementary schools, we're seeing two buildings that were 100% complying. They are using significantly lower energy, significantly less energy than this non-complying building that had some non-compliance with the water components and then also with the envelope. So we're not drawing any conclusions here that this non-complying building uses a ton of extra energy because it's non-complying in these two areas, but we could be making these kind of inferences with a, a larger sample size. And we could drill down to understand, okay, what is which systems are not complying? What could potentially be leading to this? And we'd be looking at that across averages of, of all of the buildings that we're looking at. So this, this is an example of understanding on the total EUI level um, what, what could be contributing to this energy use, um, high or low, and, and what, how does the code relate to that. Another thing that we can do is even drill down below these systems and look at the actual characteristics and the particular design of some of these buildings and, and what the issues are there. Another thing to note is just that, again, this is all actual energy use, and we have some very low um, DUI buildings. This, this one is less than 20 kBTU per square foot. This small office is um, looks like it's close to maybe 16 or 17. So this is the same uh, the same buildings and basically the same information except that we're seeing the disaggregated end uses and um, we have heating is the maroon bar cooling is the blue green is the fan energy and orange is other which we weren't able to do it for this pilot, but in the future studies, we're hoping to be able to disaggregate the lighting. So other would really just be mainly process loads and, and flood loads, and, and we would have lighting broken out separately. But this is important to see because now you're looking at a non-complying building versus complying building. And you can look at these stacked bar charts to see, okay, what systems are actually contributing to that difference? And in this case, we see that the heating energy use is very high. We also have uh, a large um, other category. It's, there's not a lot that we can say about these distinctions in the pilot, but just showing how we can actually look at the data is important. In this case, we're seeing uh, not too much of, of a difference in the heating load. But again, it's important to, to understand um, or to see that this is the kind of breakout that we can look at. So next, uh, this is the benchmarking component of the study. We're comparing the building EUIs from the small pilot to the 2006 new construction baseline results for the state of Washington. And the sites from the pilot study are the green dots and the red triangles. The red triangles are the not overall non-complying buildings and the green dots are the overall complying. 
The box plots represent the baseline quartile with the minimum and maximum uh, lines, and we also have the median. So when we're looking at elementary schools, the line across is the median EUI for the base, all of the, the sites that were in the baseline study. We're showing the dots and the triangles to show the progress that we're making with these buildings that were built to a code that was approximately two code cycles later, two to three code cycles later. In the larger study, we might not have the individual dots. We would likely be showing the median from the 2006 baseline study and the median or average from our new study. But what you can see is that this complying building, non-complying building for a school is right about the median from uh, this 2006 study, which was buildings that were that were built in two to four years prior to 2006. And then we have these two complying buildings that are well below. And you can see similar um, similar relationships for the other buildings. So in addition, uh, this is the same graphic, but I've added a uh, Washington State Energy Code target. So this can show not only um, progress for the code in general, but also against targets. Washington State has a pretty aggressive target to reduce the energy use in residential and uh, commercial buildings to 70% below the 2006 numbers by 2031. So I've added this little dotted line for each of these building types. This is the target. It's, it's very low, as one would expect when you're reducing the energy use by 70%. This is a legally required mandate. So this shows where um, this target is in relation to the median of 2006. So it gives you an idea of how much we're actually reducing. And then it shows you where the non-complying and complying buildings fall um, on that spectrum. So we're also able to benchmark uh, the end uses. This is a benchmark of the LPDs. Uh, these are the median LPDs from the 2006 study, and these are the LPDs from our pilot. So they're, they're dropping steadily, and um, I would assume that they're going to keep going on that trajectory. Uh, but that is not necessarily a finding from this pilot. So that, that really covers the, the conceptual framework for the methodology and also provides an idea of and a, a demonstration of the type of data and analysis we can get out of this approach that is uh, fairly integrated and holistic and meets multiple objectives for multiple stakeholders. And the, uh, next steps for this methodology are to put it into practice. NIA is launching the Oregon code evaluation uh, in the fourth quarter of this year. We're working with them on that study, and then they are intending to, at some point, likely next year, move into Washington State and then eventually Idaho and Montana. Okay, thanks, Poppy. That was great. And thank you, Mike. Uh, both those studies were really interesting and um, um, got a lot of good questions that came in. Before we go into the questions, I want to just touch on uh, DOE's Building Energy Codes program resources and out on energycodes.gov. If you haven't taken a look at it on the website, a couple of things you might want to go take a look at. Compliance software available. We have ComCheck. ComCheck Web shows compliance to the uh, ASHRAE 90.1 and IECC, the last three versions and current version of uh, 2015 and 90.1 2013. We do have a help desk if you have questions related to the energy codes or compliance tools. We have code notes that are available on specific code items. 
that you might be interested in and taking a look at. There are several publications. We do energy cost analysis, energy savings that um, are done by our energy modelers on a state-by-state -state basis and a national analysis. We have resource guides. And then we do a whole complete set of training materials. If you're a trainer or you're interested in the whole complete set of training, uh, we have 90.1 and IECC training materials that are available out on the same page that you went to register for this webinar out on um, energycodes.gov. Again, we're going to have these webinars every other month throughout next year. If you have any topic items that you think would be of interest, please submit them. If uh, you didn't take down the, the, the reminder webinar email, you can submit those topic items through our help desk, and the help desk link is out there on energycodes.gov as well. So at this time, we're going to start into the questions. We've received a lot of really good questions. And I'm going to start off with the series of questions that we received for uh, Mike's presentation. Um, and Mike, if you want me to uh, turn it back over to you as presenter, if you want to bring up any of your slides, just let me know. So let's take a look at some of these questions here. So one of the first questions that came in was, how does a consultant ensure that the new design meets the energy code uh, compliance without completing an energy modeling analysis? Can you touch on that, Mike? Sure. Um, so the majority of projects, the vast majority of projects, uh, don't use the performance path. They use prescriptive path. Uh, I understand that might be different in California. But uh, the nine projects that we looked at were all prescriptive-based projects. So um, energy modeling analysis, I think that's what you're asking here, you know, for performance-based um, compliance did not really come into play. Now, as we're rolling this methodology out on a larger scale, we are sure that we will run into buildings that uh, have gone through down the performance path. And we are actually testing a methodology to um, accommodate those buildings as well. As well. And, and basically what it comes down to is for every, um, every measure, the performance path defines a baseline condition. So for instance, you might have used higher mechanical efficiency uh, in order to trade off for less insulation or something like that. In that case, the higher mechanical efficiency becomes really the code condition and the uh, less insulation becomes the code condition. So then we just assess compared to those adjusted baselines. And we're working on that right now. So I, I hope that answers the question. If it doesn't, maybe type something back and I'll see if I can uh, address it more directly. And you know, we won't get through all these questions today, folks. Uh, if you still have a question that you'd like answered, you can submit it through our help desk and we will get it directed to the proper person and, and make sure we get you an answer. So the ones that we can with as limited time that we can go through the series of questions that we receive, we have received a lot of questions. So the next question for you, Mike, is um, are the tabulated lost uh, dollar savings on an annual basis? The savings I presented were, I presented the savings in, in two ways, on an annual basis and on a life cycle basis, so over the entire life of the building. Okay. Were all of the savings calculations based only on three conditions, compliant, 50% compliant, 0% compliance, or did you use any intermediate metrics such as 75% compliant? to calculate a total saving? So, yes, any inter intermediate condition was accommodated. Uh, depending on what the measure was, some, for the most part, by simulating three conditions, you can develop a regression or some way to identify what any in-between uh, value would, would uh, result in a loss cost savings. For some measures, we had to do more than three. Um, but yeah, it's not that they just pick the closest one, you know, code below or worse. They actually identify the exact condition and as best we could, we give the um, direct lost energy cost savings for that condition. Okay. 
with a building life savings of uh, around 45,000 plus and an annual savings around $3,600, were you figuring that the estimated life of a building is only 13 years? I think this was on one of your slides. Okay, so I, um, the $46,000 is not just the sum of the annual savings. It's the, pre it's the life cycle cost savings, the present value of the savings for the, over the life of the building. So, um, you know, using engineering economics, savings in the future is discounted, uh, not worth quite as much as savings today. So it's not a straight multiplication. The measure lives that we were using differed depending on the measure. So if it was an envelope uh, measure like wall insulation or windows, we assigned a 30-year life to it. We didn't go any higher than 30. Some studies use 40, um, but we stayed at, at 30 for this. It actually turns out it doesn't make too much of a difference once you get that far out in the future, whether you use 30 or 40. And then for things like building controls and mechanical equipment and lighting fixtures, I believe it was 15 years. Um, one other thing to notice, uh, I want to mention, Pam, um, is, or I want to mention, and, and Pam maybe can take care of this. What, what I didn't put in this uh, presentation is a link to the technical support document, the full report on this study, and I don't know if we can add it before it goes up uh, on the website, but that would probably be good because there's a lot more data in the full study than there is in the slideshow, of course. Yeah, we can get that added. We'll add that to the presentation. That's not a problem. Okay, so another question that came in is, how many tons was the equipment oversized per building? Oh boy, that I, that I couldn't tell you. Uh, and I see the next question is kind of the same from the same person or what, or what percent uh, oversizing. Uh, I don't know that offhand. I know that um, we, we did get some feedback that, that uh, there was oversizing over 200% on some of the buildings, but I couldn't tell you an average or even the range um, okay. without doing some lookup. Sorry. Um. Another question that came in was the was the saving for mechanical systems based on installation cost or operation cost? If both, what is the breakdown? The savings in all cases is based on operation cost. Okay. A couple more and then we'll get over to Poppy and, and she can answer some from her study. What specific items are you concerned about regarding having just one site visit, or did you have any? Well, yeah, it, it depends on when that site visit is. So I, I think I mentioned this during the talk that if you go out there once the building is completely constructed, you're not going to see a lot of the uh, envelope components, the insulation, the slab insulation, the wall insulation. If you go out there too early, you're not going to see uh, a lot of the controls fully implemented yet. So, you know, that's, that's the problem. It's, there's, okay. no, there's no one time that's really best. It's, it's a lot of different times. All right. We, we received a lot of good comments as far as they thought that that was an excellent study that you did, Mike. And, Poppy, I have some questions for you. We'll switch it over to you so we, you can address them from yours. First question that came in um, when you were presenting was, did you – Look at fenestration solar heat gain coefficient as part of your um, one of your options or your your path when you were going through the prescriptive path, I believe. Yes, we did. Okay. Next question was: Is there any process in place to evaluate the cost of compliance versus the projected savings? Is there any way to determine? if the projected life cycle savings is greater than the cost of compliance? Uh, if I understand that question correctly, that's pretty much along the lines of what the PNNL study is looking at. And I would say that with the characteristics that we're collecting with our study, that you could actually likely do that type of analysis. It's not a part of our current methodology, but it's something that Nia is going to be looking at, and we're going to be discussing that potential with PNNL just in terms of 
ensuring that we're collecting the right input to, to ensure that that is a possibility in the future. Yeah, I, yeah, I think can I add something on this? Sure, go ahead. So I think I think this question is is more about um, is the code itself cost effective? Is is the way I'm reading this? Uh, is the projected life cycle savings greater than the cost of compliance? And while that wasn't done in either one of our studies, we at PNNL do do that all the time. So there is a study um, for ASHRAE standard 90.1, each of the last two versions, and the IECC for residential and, and potentially for commercial also, that looks into uh, each new round of code and the changes that were made and compares that to the cost of those changes and the savings from them and determines um, the uh, cost effectiveness of the new version of the code. So that is also available on the BECP website, if that is the question you were getting at. So hopefully we answered it. No, that's good because I mentioned that as a resource, but I'm glad you clarified that about those studies. So this question could be for both of you, and, and, I, and you, I, you might have cleared this when you were speaking about it, but it's a, it, the question was, were all studies conducted on buildings built using the prescriptive compliance path? Or were any buildings studied using the performance-based compliance path using energy modeling? Well, Either for, one of you. The, I'll, I'll answer. Yeah. I'll answer that first. Um, there was one of the twelve buildings that went the performance path in our study, but the rest of them were went the prescriptive path and. And we do find that to be the predominant approach, at least in Washington State and in most states in the Northwest. Okay. This question is for you, Mike. Are these pilots from DOE for code compliance and energy audits extended to other states? Yeah, so that's the project that I was talking about, the $1.7 million project that IMT is uh, starting on. It is going to be extended to um, four different states, Nevada, Iowa, Nebraska, and Florida, I believe, are the states. And they're looking at at least 250 buildings in this study. OK. Uh, Poppy, this question is for you. What was the typical mechanical systems allow, allowable energy use intensity for your study of those buildings? Can you repeat the question? What was the typical mechanical systems allowable energy use intensity for your study of those buildings, of these buildings? Um, I, I can answer part of that. Uh, mainly the, my response is that we didn't have a, a target or allowable EUI for the mechanical systems. We were just looking at what the actual EUI for the system that we found. But it is an interesting question, especially if we're looking into the future and having uh, outcome targets for the whole building or specific systems in the building. But it's, it wasn't something that was a part of our study, and it's there isn't any allowable or non-allowable EUI for mechanical systems for the Washington Code. Okay. Next question that came in is a good one. During billing analysis, was commissioning verified to ensure building systems were operating as intended at or near their rated efficiencies? So we did look at commissioning and wherever possible we verify that but I will say that that is actually a difficult thing to confirm especially after the fact if you're looking at it you know six months to a year or longer after because a, a lot of that documentation is not available but it, it was part of the methodology and it's something that we plan to check and we're hoping to be able to that will be more successful in the future if we can work with the jurisdictions more closely. 
And another question for you, Poppy. What was the name of the tool you used to disaggregate the end uses, and was there any submetering? The tool was called EVSIM. It's E V S I M, and it's a tool that was developed in the Northwest, and we use that to do the disaggregation. We did not do any uh, induced metering for this study. Okay. We'll take uh, two more questions here. Mike, this is a question for you. I'm not sure you'll be able to answer it, but I'll throw it at you anyway. Do you believe the 2018 ICC multifamily specific code will reduce the complexity of code compliance for commercial buildings? Okay, so I think this is in regard, there's a, a proposal to the IACC to pull multifamily uh, construction out of low-rise low multifamily out of residential and, and high-rise out of the commercial provisions and create their own chapter. Uh, so I think I understand the question well. I'm not sure I, I have an answer. Uh, I think it has the potential to reduce the complexity and to um, make it you know, more suitable for multifamily uh, in the long run. My understanding is they're just pulling out the same requirements that are in both of those sections now and, and combining them into a separate section. So I don't think from a technical standpoint, it's gonna, it, it will make, you know, improvements to the appropriateness of the requirements. But I think in the long run, it, it has the potential to do that. So I guess that would make it less complex. Uh, and then I suppose if you're just looking at multifamily, and don't have to worry yourself with all the requirements in the other two chapters that don't apply to multifamily, you know, that's a benefit as well. So, so you know, thinking about it, yeah, I, I guess it, it would have a, uh, you know, it, it probably will reduce the complexity. Um, one more question for you. How will the 250 buildings going to be selected in your next study? <laughs> um, you, I say, can I volunteer buildings? So I am not selecting the buildings. That is a, um, you know, IMT, uh, Institute for Market Transformation, and has teamed up with a bunch of uh, other contractors to do this next study. That's, it's not a PNNL study. We're going to be providing some technical support to DOE for that study. So we are not involved in the, um, in the recruiting. Uh, and I don't know that a recruiting approach has been developed fully yet, so I can't really answer that question. Okay. Well, our time is up today, and we thank you for everyone that's participated in uh, our webinar. Again, we will be holding a webinar every other month, so take a look out on the training page on energycodes.gov. If you have any topic items that you think would be of interest, please submit them our way. If you had a question that we did not get to and you would like to receive an answer, please submit them through our help desk and we'll get you uh, to the appropriate person to help answer that for you. And at this time, all of you can disconnect. Thank you for attending today's webinar.